Good morning, Open Door Ministries, and happy Easter. We're here to celebrate Easter this morning. And I thought I would take the opportunity to talk about a big question. So you kind of consider it like this week's question. This week's question, how did God atone us? How did he restore the relationship and make us at one with him again? So that's the big question. And as always, you know, as I present some of these you know, complicated theological ideas, I don't expect that you need to agree with me. We can agree to disagree on this topic. This is not one of those topics that, you know, if you believe one way, you're going to go to heaven. And if you believe another way, you're going to go to hell. But it, I do believe that the topic of atonement will change the way you think about God. And as you think about God differently, you will live out your life differently as you imitate him. So let's take a look at this. I call this the power of Easter atonement. So let me talk a little bit about heterodoxy versus heresy. Now, oftentimes we talk about people and they talk about theology and they say, oh, you know, we have the orthodox view. It's been taught this way for 2,000 years. And that's not true. Many of these ideas have not been taught the same way for 2,000 years. You can trace the history of how atonement has been changing over the centuries. And so we call these heterodoxies. In other words, these are different ideas, hetero. Okay? They're not necessarily heresy, although some people at different times throughout the history of the church, especially when the church was you know, very abusive, declared certain people heretics for their ideas on atonement. So here's a big theological question for you. A big theological question. What happened at the cross and the resurrection? Good Friday to Easter Sunday, what happened? What exactly did God do? What did Jesus accomplish? How did our relationship change? What happened? And so we oftentimes say the simple answer is atonement. Atonement happened. But atonement's one of those words, we throw that around, it's like, well, what exactly does that mean, atonement? Atonement is from a Middle English word. It means to be at one with. We are at one. And so the idea is the restoration of a relationship. How did God restore a relationship with him? How was that accomplished at the cross and through the resurrection? And I'm going to talk about that. Now, here's a second big theological question. How did God make us at one with him? How exactly did the, what's the mechanism? And I'm going to tell you right now, however you choose to answer this reveals your heart and how you perceive God. And I'm hoping to change that this morning. So we'll jump right on into this one. Today, when fundamentalists talk about atonement, they usually mean penal substitutionary atonement. And that's probably not something you're going to hear outside of a class in theology. Penal substitutionary atonement. What the heck is that? Okay. Well, let me kind of explain it to you. This means for them that we were separated from God from our sins and that God was very angry at us. And that also means that God's wrath was then poured out upon Jesus in our place. So Jesus was our substitute. He took the wrath of God upon himself to save us from himself. And that's what happened. Now, I don't subscribe to penal substitutionary atonement, I think there's some problems with this. I've seen Facebook memes. People are like, so let me get this straight. God came down himself, killed himself to save us from himself. What's going on there? Right. So I don't necessarily follow this. I don't think this presents the best view of God. This presents a view of God as angry, wrathful, punishing, violent. And I don't believe that lines up with the characteristics of God. Now, although penal substitutionary atonement is one view, it's not the only view. In fact, it's not even the first view of atonement. The very earliest views, the predominant view of the atonement in the early church was something called ransom theory. And it went something along the lines of this, that when human beings sinned, they changed who their master was. When we were in obedience to God, he was our master. But as we sinned, Satan became our master. In a sense, we sold ourselves to Satan, and he is our master. And so Jesus came and paid a price to redeem us, to ransom us away from Satan. And so we are able now to be 
back again as servants of God because we have been bought at a price from Satan. And you can find verses in the Bible that would suggest this. And so the early church believed in ransom theory. Later, satisfaction theory dominated in the early Middle Ages. So theology grows, it progresses, it changes. People discuss this, they have new ideas. And so they came up with what was called the satisfaction theory of atonement. And what this was, was that they said, human beings in their disobedience had moved away from God. But Jesus, in coming as a human being and having perfect obedience to God, satisfied the requirement for humanity and restored our relationship. That's a very different view. There were other ones as well. As I said, penal substitutionary atonement. Uh, it had its early development in the 11th century by Anselm of Canterbury. So we don't even have this idea in the church of God pouring out his wrath upon Jesus you know, as a substitute for us until about the 11th century. And then it was later fully developed by Calvin in the 16th century. And you know, anybody who knows me knows that I'm not really a Calvinist. I, I don't like a lot of the ideas. I don't like the implication where his theology takes us. It takes us to a very dark place. But really, I would say Calvin is absolutely the person who really fully developed this idea of penal substitutionary atonement and that happened in the 16th century. What I want to point out, there's other theories, uh, moral influence theory that Jesus, through his exemplary life, uh, influenced us now to live better lives, or the recapitulation theory that in the first Adam, all mankind fell. So in the second Adam, Jesus, all mankind is risen up because the first Adam failed, but Jesus recapitulates or repeats his life and does it right this time. So that's the recapitulation theory. So there's all these different theories about atonement, and all of these theories were at one time considered orthodoxy. This is the truth. This is the correct teaching. And at some times, they were all considered heterodoxy. Well, we don't think that's the right one, but it's not heretical. And more recently, as sort of the church is more and more fragmented, more and more violent, more and more argumentative, more and more angry, a lot of times we get accused of heresy for holding any other view other than penal substitutionary atonement. Let me talk about what I want to suggest. I'd like to suggest another view. I would like to suggest what's called nonviolent atonement. This was first suggested by Duns Scotus in the 14th century. He was a Franciscan philosopher, theologian, and it was fully developed by Gustav Allen and J. Denny Weaver in the late 20th and early 21st centuries. So in some senses, it's been around for a while, being discussed, and in other senses, it's been more recently developed, more, more fleshed out in more recent years, more recent decades. The name of it is called Christus Victor, which means Christ victorious, that Christ is the victor. And it has been developed in nonviolent atonement theory as we continue to talk about, is God violent or not? Is God wrathful or not? And so I'd like to talk about that in a little more detail. Again, I'm sharing this with you. It's, it's ideas I want you to think about. You may choose to believe it. You may choose not to believe it. Again, it's not going to determine where you end up once you die. The basis of Christus Victor is that God did not need Jesus to die to change his relationship with human beings. Let me repeat that because there are some people who might be like, did he just say what I think he just said? God did not need Jesus to die to change his relationship with human beings. I know there's some people who are like, no, Jesus came to die, or Jesus lived to die, or that was God's purpose, that Jesus would come and die. You know, Jesus needed to die as a substitution for us so that we could go to heaven. And I'm saying, no, I, I don't believe that's true. Jesus did not need to die. In Malachi 3, 6, one of the things I want to point out is, you know, they say Jesus had to die to change the relationship between God and human beings. But in Malachi 3, 6, it says, For I, the Lord, do not change. I don't change. Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Malachi, the prophet, is speaking to the children of Israel and says, you know, God doesn't destroy you because he loves you. 
And that never changes. God has not consumed you because of his faithful, unconditional love always, and that never changes. So I don't believe that in the fall of humankind, God's relationship with us changed from his perspective. God has always loved us. On the other hand, human beings changed, and we didn't always love God. See, the issue is not with God needing to be changed. The issue is with human beings need to be changed. In 2 Timothy 2.13, it says this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. God is love. Love causes no harm. So God cannot change away from that. How can God pour out wrath upon humankind if he is by the very definition of love and it causes no harm? He didn't need to change. It's human beings who needed to change. His faithful, unconditional love for humanity is always there. And this is one of the bedrocks of my faith, that God loves us no matter what, all the time, forever, never changing. That God is good. So, what exactly happened on the cross? Okay, What happened on the cross is that Jesus delivered a decisive and final blow to the power of death and sin. That's what happened on the cross. Jesus delivered this decisive blow and destroyed death and sin. That is why we say Christ is victorious. Christ is victor. Christ victorious over the powers of darkness. Christ victorious over death. Christ victorious over sin. The resurrection stands as proof that Jesus is the victor over death and sin. See, if Jesus had not defeated death, he'd still be in the grave. But the resurrection says he is victorious. Isn't that an amazing thing to consider? Death, where is your sting? It is no more. Jesus has been resurrected from the dead. Darkness has been destroyed. Sin no longer has dominion in our life. It no longer has control over us because Jesus showed us how to defeat it. He is the victor. Now, did Jesus need to die? No. <gasps> how can you say such a thing? I was taught that all my life. We sing songs about that. You know, uh, 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 live to die. Jesus lived to die. No, Jesus did not need to die. That was not part of God's plan to kill his son. And yet, he was killed. God did not require a blood sacrifice to appease himself. Now, if you hang around Open Door Ministries, and you know me, I kind of have this thing about all these hymns and all these other songs, worship choruses, that are all about blood. I'm like, we are not a blood cult. We don't believe in blood sacrifice, okay? That's violence, and violence comes from the human heart, not from the heart of God. So I really don't like any of those songs, and, and, and I'm, I'm lucky enough that the people who choose the songs honor that within me. They're like, yeah, we won't do the blood songs. Oh, nothing but the blood of Je right, What's with all the blood? Just drives me nuts. But God did not require a blood sacrifice to appease himself. There's going to be a whole lot of people who are be like, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know, the whole sacrificial system, that was, a, you know, kind of like a, a, a foreshadowing of Jesus coming. You know, he's, he's slaughtered like a lamb, you know, all this kind of stuff. I know, I know what you were taught. I was raised up in it. I know. I know. Oh, gee, see, I told you. Here's Charles. Charles is here to yell at me. Okay, Charles, what is it? The wages of sin are death. Romans 6.23. Checkmate, you heretic. Yeah, see, you know, we deserve to die. We sin. And so God's going to kill us. We deserve to die. Jesus came. He died. He was a sacrifice in our place. That's it. I, okay. I was raised in this. I get it. But let me respond to that, Charles. 
Did Jesus need to die? Notice that it says wages, not punishment. And depending on how you read wages, you get a whole different uh, perspective on this. Did we sin and God decided to curse us with death? Is, was God punishing us with death? Death was not a punishment. Death was the consequent of sin, not a punishment from God. It's the natural consequent of happens. You die when you move away from the presence of God. When you break that relationship with him, you die. It's the consequence of what we did, what human beings did. It's the natural consequence. Much as if you work, the natural consequence is you get paid. And if you don't, you're not working for this person anymore. Let me finish off the verse because Charles only quoted part of it. For the wages of sin is death. Now get this. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. The gift of God is eternal life. Yes, we earned death through our actions. And yet, what we're given instead is Jesus as a gift to bring us eternal life. Duns Scotus, again, that Franciscan theologian and philosopher, believed that God's freedom had to be maintained at all costs. If God needed or demanded a blood sacrifice to love God's own creation, then God was not freely loving us. Can you catch that? God's love is no longer given freely. It's conditional. It becomes transactional. I will love you if you do this for me, I will do this for you. And God loses his freedom. He loses his sovereignty. In fact, he simply ceases to be God because he no longer fulfills his characteristics. If God needed or demanded a blood sacrifice to love us, then he wasn't freely loving us in the beginning. And that changes your whole idea about who God is, how he's going to act, and how we should act when we imitate him. Then Scotus says, Jesus was pure gift. The idea of gift is much more transformative than necessity, payment, or transaction. Pure gift. You give a gift to somebody, you don't expect that they have to give you something back. You don't expect right, that they're going to do a certain something with it. It's pure gift. It's given. No strings attached. And Jesus was that pure gift. It shows that God is not violent, but loving. It is we who are violent. Here, God gives a pure gift of himself to humankind. And how did we react to it as human beings? Violently. God did not need Jesus to die. We, as human beings, killed him because of the violence within our own heart. We killed him. And I'm going to explain even in more detail why we killed him a little bit later. Jesus was not changing God's mind about us. He was changing our minds about God. You know, we tend to create God in our own image, and so we project out this angry, wrathful God because that's what's in our hearts. And God sends the pure gift of Jesus. We should be seeing God as loving, unconditionally, and nonviolent. It should change our minds about who he is. If God and Jesus are not violent and vindictive, then our excuse for the same violence and vindictiveness is taken away forever. If God is punitive and torturing, then we have permission to do the same. You see, whoever your God is reveals your heart. Oftentimes we're projecting and making God in our own image. But it changes our behavior too. How many times have I heard evangelicals standing behind the pulpit, on the air, on the radio, on their podcast, on YouTube, on the television, and they're screaming and they're yelling and they're calling for violence and for destruction because, well, well God did it. God wiped out the whole world once. You know, and God had to kill his son. God is violent. God is vindictive. God is wrathful, so I can be too because I'm made in his image. 
And it changes us. How you think about God changes your behavior. And so this morning, I'm really asking you to reconsider. To reconsider what God did. He gave us the perfect, pure gift. And it was us who killed him, not God. God and Jesus are not violent. God and Jesus are not vindictive. They're nonviolent. And so if we imitate them, we have no excuse for violence or revenge. God never wanted blood sacrifices. God never wanted blood sacrifices, never. I know a lot of you are saying, oh, no, I, don't. I looked at the Old Testament. You, you look at that Leviticus and you look at Deuteronomy and there's a whole lot of instructions in there about blood sacrifices about who's supposed to sacrifice what and how it's supposed to be done and who gets a portion of the fat and who gets a portion of the meat. And, uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about blood sacrifices. But I'm going to tell you today, God did not want blood sacrifices. <gasps> oh, geez, I knew it would happen. Mabel, Mabel's going to be upset with me. I can't, she heard me say it. Here we go. What is it, Mabel? Oh, Bible verse, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. 1 Peter 1, 18 through 19. Blood of a lamb. Sacrifices. God wanted sacrifices. God demanded a blood sacrifice. Jesus was slaughtered like a lamb who was slain. It's in the song. <laughs> yeah, okay. And we grew up with this. We grew up with this idea about all these sacrifices, all these blood sacrifices that went on constantly, that God wanted those. But I can show you all throughout the Old Testament, prophet after prophet will tell you the same thing. Here's a Bible verse for you, Mabel. The multitude of your sacrifices, what are they to me, says the Lord. I have more than enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fatted animals. I have no pleasure in the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. Isaiah was telling the people, this is not what God wants. He's not looking for blood. He's not looking for death. He's looking for obedience. Another verse, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, add your burnt offerings to the sacrifices and eat the flesh. For Now catch this, for in the day that I brought them out of the land of Egypt, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. <laughs> catch that one again. God is saying, I brought you out of Egypt I gave you, you know, the commandments. I made the covenant with you. But guess what I did not do? I didn't even talk about burnt offerings and sacrifices. Oh, wait a minute, it's there in Leviticus and Deuteronomy. Guess what? That's for human beings. Human beings did that. God is saying, I did not speak to your fathers or command them concerning burnt offerings and sacrifices. But this command I gave them. You know what I told them? You know what I told them when I formed the covenant with them? When I brought them out of the land of Egypt? Here's what I told them. Obey my voice and I will be your God, and you shall be my people, and walk all the way that I command you, that it may be well with you. Jeremiah 7, 21 through 23. God is saying, I didn't ask for these sacrifices. I don't know where you people are getting this as a foreshadowing of a sacrifice to come. I didn't ask for sacrifices. You asked for sacrifices. You wanted them. The people are the ones who wanted the sacrificial system because they're violent, they're bloody. That's what's in our hearts. And God is saying, all I asked you for was to obey my commands, and you create this whole religious system to act out your violence. So, there on the cross, there on the cross, what did Jesus reveal about humanity? Good Friday, Jesus on the cross. What does it reveal about humanity? Well, know this, that in ancient times, humans were sacrificed as scapegoats. They were sacrificed to appease the gods because we believed that the gods were as violent as we were. And we would sacrifice human beings. And then we come to the story of Abraham and Isaac where God says to Abraham, go and sacrifice your son. Go practice some human sacrifice. 
But before that can happen, God substitutes an animal. And the story changes. This is not how you please God, by offering up human beings, by blood sacrifice of human beings, but do it with animals. Animal sacrifice allowed humans to act out their own violence against innocent victims. Humans needed violence. They needed some way to act it out, to ritually do it before the community, to act out what was in their heart. But God is not wanting it. And believe me, God definitely did not want human sacrifice. So if God definitely did not want human sacrifice, why do you think he would sacrifice his son? See, animal sacrifice was a temporary measure until Christ ended the sacrifices. Not by being the perfect sacrifice, but by breaking the cycle of violence. And once you break the cycle of violence and you remove violence, you remove the need for ritual victims to suffer that violence. Christ broke the cycle of violence in humankind. He showed us, here's how you stop the violence within your heart. Here's how you live a nonviolent life. And he broke this cycle. And so there's no more need for these ritual victims for human beings to act out their violence. That's why there's an end to sacrifices. Animal sacrifice was a concession to humans like divorce was a concession. All these sacrifices, that's not God's plan. That's not what God wanted. But because human beings are flawed and imperfect and hard-headed, our hearts are messed up, God made concessions for them, much like divorce. Matthew 19, 8, where he says, Jesus replied, Moses permitted you to divorce your wives because your hearts were hard. But it was not this way from the beginning. It doesn't say I permitted it. it doesn't say God, you know, I, God, permitted you to do this. It says Moses did it. Why? Because your hearts are hard. It's a concession. Until we can bring you to perfected state, we're going to have to do this for now. And the animal sacrifices are the same way. Until we can bring you to a perfected state, you're going to need some kind of mechanism to act out your violence. So what did Jesus reveal about humanity? Jesus on the cross is like a person looking into a mirror. And it reveals who they are. As we look at Jesus on the cross, we see who we as humanity are. Jesus on the cross holds a mirror to humanity and reflects who we are and even what we are capable of. Here's a picture of a scapegoat. This was an ancient practice. You know, yeah, they slaughtered a lot of goats too. They also laid all their sins upon one goat and sent him out into the desert. See, we blame that's part of human beings. We blame. We put the blame, all the guilt, upon one innocent victim. We do it over and over again. This is why Jesus talks about, you know that prophet that was challenging you and forcing you to look at your own hearts? You didn't like him, and so you killed him. He was a scapegoat. Rene Girard, philosopher, linguist, talks about the scapegoat mechanism. That it serves humanity. It does something for us. Here's what he talks about. He says, human beings, societies, fall into conflict. Why? Because our hearts are messed up. We fall into conflict with each other. We just look around the world. I can't remember a time in my own lifetime where we have not been at war with somebody. We fall into conflict. This conflict threatens the social structure. So society picks a scapegoat. And it's usually, that scapegoat is usually the one standing up saying, you know, the system's messed up. The powers that be are fueling this conflict and profiting off this conflict. They pick that person, the prophet of their time, and they silence and kill them as a victim. And that appeases the inherent violent nature of human beings for a while. So every time society gets more and more chaotic, 
We just go around and we find scapegoats. It's you, it's you, it's your fault. You're the one, you're stirring up things, you're doing it. And they silence them and they kill them. And that murder satisfies our own bloodlust within our own human hearts for a short time. And we just go through the cycle over and over again. And this is what happened to Jesus. Jesus came and said, humans, your hearts are messed up. Repent. Return to God. Live the life you're supposed to live. Live the life you're created to be. Imitate God. It's about obedience. And he questioned the authorities. He questioned the power structure. You religious leaders, why are you leading them down these wrong paths? Why are you perpetrating the violence? Why are you exploiting people? Why are you making people uh, disenfranchised? Why are you doing this? Why are you creating these outsiders? Why are you putting these heavy burdens on people? What are you doing? And they silenced him. And they killed him. And they made him a scapegoat. They did it. Human beings did it, not God. God didn't need it. Human beings needed it. And so they're the ones who killed Jesus. Jesus threatened the social structure and the powers of his time, so human beings, not God, killed him. And when we look at the cross, that is what gets reflected back at us. This is who you are. This is what you do. You notice how nicely penal substitution theory of atonement separates us from this? It wasn't me who put Jesus on the cross. It was my sins. See, I, now I'm one step removed. It wasn't human beings did this. It's, well, their sins did it. We're one step removed. And I'm sure as this theory gets developed, we'll be even more removed, more and more and more. I hear some people, well, if Adam hadn't sinned. See, it wasn't even me. It was some other guy. And we remove ourselves from the horrible image of when we stare into the mirror of the cross. How did Jesus break the power of death and sin? Because that's what I'm saying. I'm saying that Christ is victorious. That's what happened at the cross. That's how he became at one with him again. He broke the power of death. He broke the power of sin. That's really what happened there. Well, it's through the resurrection. It's through the empty tomb. It's through the power of the resurrection that death and sin are broken. What do we have to fear of death anymore? Christ has been risen, we will be risen like him. I do not need to fear death anymore. Yes, the wages of my sin, the consequence of my sin was death. But that's just a temporary state now that I will pass through. I now have hope. I now have hope that I will be raised again like Christ was raised. Jesus taught us how to break the cycle of violence. Sin, violence, vengeance, vendetta, all of that's done. In the ancient world, they practice vendetta. I like to compare it, and I've used this example before. You know that movie, The Untouchables, Kevin Costner, Sean Connery. Their two characters are having a little talk. And they talk about the Chicago way. He pulls a knife, you pull a gun. He puts one of your guys in the hospital, you put two of their guys in the morgue. Vendetta. You hurt me somehow, I'm going to hurt you back, I'm going to hurt you back worse. It's a shame that we have politicians who talk this way. Because this is not God's way. See, because man was sinful and we practiced vendetta, God actually had to limit it. God had to say, whoa, limit, right here. Leviticus 24, 19 through 20. If anyone injures his neighbor as he has done it, so it shall be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he has given a person shall be given to him. In other words, okay, he broke your arm. You don't go break two of his and his legs. It has to be equal. I'm limiting your guys' vendetta because you guys are out of control. That's a limit on vendetta, 
But when Jesus came, he showed us how to break the cycle of vendetta, how to break this cycle of violence. Because he says, you have heard that it was said eye for eye and tooth for tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to them the other cheek also. If somebody hits you, you don't hit them back harder or twice as much. That's not Jesus. He says, turn the other cheek. Because you take that violence into yourself and then it stops. And then the cycle is broken. He taught us how to break the cycle of violence. Jesus taught that through peaceful, nonviolent resistance, we can break the cycle of violence. By refusing to follow the cycle of vendetta, the cycle ends and the violence ends. That's what it shows on the cross. That's what it shows in the empty tomb. Christ on the cross acts not only as a mirror, reflecting humanity and allowing us to see ourselves for who we are. He shows us God as nonviolent, unconditionally loving. He's on the cross. He suffered the horrible, horrible violence of being the scapegoat for this society. And he looks at them and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. And he ends the violence there. He could have jumped off of that cross. He could have called an army of angels and leveled that city. And he chose not to because he knew that would just bring more violence. And that he was not violent. That God is not violent. Penal substitutionary atonement theory reduces God to a violent God who is transactional in his love. I can't love you unless you give me blood. There will be death and violence to satisfy me or I can't love you. What a tiny, small, little tribal God that is. That is not a God worthy of worship. The empty tomb demonstrates the power of God to bring life. You thought you poured out violence. You thought you did you worse. You did the worst that you could possibly do. You killed him. But I am a God of life and I bring life. See, the violence ended there, but I have overcome it. I have overcome death. I have broken death. I have the power of life, resurrection. I'm a God of life, not a God of violence. That should change the way you think about God completely. I am a God of life, not of death. I'm not a God of violence. I'm a God of nonviolence. God now is not some petty little God with transactional love, but instead he is a life giver. And more than that, he is victor. He has beaten it all. He reigns supreme. He is sovereign above all things, death and sin and darkness. And not one power can stand against him because he is all powerful. He is the victor. That is a God worthy of worship. So, now that I've told you all this stuff, what do we do with it? Well, I want you to think about it. I want you to change your ideas about God. You know, we're raised up sometimes and we pick up ideas. They're taught to us as children and they're just ingrained in us. And it's hard to let those ideas go. But I'm telling you that if you can understand God as Christus Victor, that if you can understand God as nonviolent, it will change your heart. It will transform who you are. Transform your thinking. It transforms your behavior. So how do you live this out? How do you worship God by living this out? Well, God is nonviolent. He does not want or desire blood. He doesn't want it. He doesn't desire it. He just wants obedience. Christians must stop violent actions and violent rhetoric. We need to purge the violent rhetoric from our pulpits. Oh yeah, it whips up the crowd. We get a nice voting block to vote the way we want. With all this doom and gloom and we're fighting the kingdom of Satan. The kingdom of Satan is defeated. Christ has showed us how to live a life in victory. 
Every time they say, oh, you know, Satan's forces are advancing. We have to fight. No, we don't. Christ has already defeated them. He is the victor. He showed us how to live. And if we would just live that way, we wouldn't have to worry about it. Christians need to stop violent actions and violent rhetoric. It's not of God. It needs to be purged from our teaching. We gaze upon the cross to see how far we have fallen. I think that's why Good Friday is so important. We need to see, we need to look into that mirror. Look at how far we fell. Look at what we did. We took the perfect gift. We took this beautiful, pure gift, God giving himself to us to reveal himself to us, and we destroyed it in the most violent way possible. Because that's who we are. We need to change. We need transformation. When we look into that, we see our need. We gaze upon the cross to see the perfect gift given in unconditional love, and we know that God wasn't forced to kill him. It's not God who did this. Know that God wasn't forced to kill Jesus to love you. He has always loved you unconditionally, freely. And he continues to love you unconditionally, freely. Does that change the way you think about God? He always has and always will love you unconditionally and freely. We gaze into the empty tomb to see God revealed as a life giver and not a demander of death. He doesn't demand death. He doesn't require death. He doesn't want death. He wants life. He wants to bring us life. I've come to bring you life and that more abundantly. He's a life giver. That's who he is. So let's stop painting him and portraying him as an angry, vengeful God who's going to pour out his whole wrath upon this world and destroy it all. Sinner. We need to get rid of that kind of thinking. We gaze into the empty tomb to receive the hope of God's promise to us. Hope. And hope can do so much for us. When we know that death doesn't have a sting anymore, we're free to live because we have hope that God will fulfill his promise that he made to us. This is the promise he made to us. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all of creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers of authority. He's above it all, folks. He's the victor. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning. Now catch this, because this is the promise. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. He's victor. He is supreme. But he's the firstborn amongst the dead, not the last. As he was written, so it is promised to all of us, we shall be resurrected as well. Death, where is thy sting? We have the promise of life. That's the gift of the empty tomb. And so this Easter, this Easter, as we celebrate rebirth, as we celebrate resurrection, hold on to that hope. Hold on to it. You've been promised resurrection yourself. This is a celebration of life. May you keep that hope alive in your hearts. With that, let me close in prayer. Lord Jesus, we come before you. We thank you that you are the image of the invisible God, that we can see what God is like by looking at you. Those who have seen you have seen the Father. And you taught and you lived nonviolently. You revealed to us how to overcome sin and violence. You revealed to us that you have overcome death. You have revealed to us that you are the victor who reigns supreme. And may we imitate you in all that you do so that we may be victorious and live the best lives possible. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, once again, 
Happy Easter to all of you. I hope you have a good and glorious Easter. There, of course, is a a, uh, brunch planned. Let me close with this benediction. As you leave this place, may you be filled with hope. God's faithful and unconditional love will bring you life. God bless you all. Go in peace. You are dismissed. Thank you. We are one in Christ, we are one in God, we are one in unity. We are one in truth, we are one in faith.